this is the first PowerPoint in Chapter 7. This is going to go over how to name compounds and how to write formulas for compounds. So first, ionic and covalent compounds are named differently and their formulas are written differently. So one of the first things you're going to have to do um, when we name and write formulas is to figure out whether what you're looking at is ionic or covalent. The easiest way to do that, remember, is simply by looking at the position of the elements in the compound. For example, um, ionic compounds have an element to the left and an element to the right. Ionic compounds are represented by something called a formula unit, which is the simplest ratio of the ions present. Um, remember, the ratio is in terms of the subscript, which is the little number written after the element symbol. Because the total number of electrons gained must equal the total number of the electrons lost, the overall charge of an ionic compound should always be zero, and this is going to really come into play when you write the formulas. When you add the charge of the cation and the charge of the anion, it should exactly equal zero so that the overall compound is neutral. To determine charge of a compound or molecule, first you have to figure out whether you have a bi binary compound or what we call a poly um, compound. Bi, the prefix bi means two, so a binary compound is one in which it's only composed of two elements. It's going to have a positive monoatomic cation and a negative monoatomic anion. Mono means one, so monoatomic just means an ion that is made up of one element. A poly, poly means many, polyatomic ion is made up of more than one type of atom, so you're going to have two capital letters, and you could have a series of different subscripts, but you're going to have at least two capital letters that make up a polyatomic ion. And remember that the charge of a polyatomic ion applies to the entire group. To find ionic charges, you're going to do it in two ways. First, you're going to look at the princess towers. You're going to see that, for the most part, an element's charge is equal to its group number, the ones in the high towers here, the representative elements. So any element in group 1A has a charge of plus 1, 2A plus 2. Skip across 3A is plus 3 and then you actually get um, plus or minus 4. You can also think of this as 0. You're not going to have a 4A element in an ionic compound. And then you have um, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1 all the way across. So that's very easy. You just simply look at the location of an element in, on the periodic table and that tells you the charge. If the element falls in what we call the dungeon, in the D block here, you're going to have to take your periodic table packet, flip it to the other side, and you're going to see that there's a list of um, charges and elements listed there. That's where you're going to find the charge of those. Some of the elements in the dungeon have what we call variable charges, meaning they not only have a charge that's not a regular repeating pattern, but they can actually have more than one charge, and we'll talk about that in a second. You do not have to memorize the names of the polyatomic ions, but you do have to know a little bit about how they're named. You can find the names right on the polyatomic ion chart. Most polyatomic ions are what we call oxyanions. Oxy for oxygen, anion meaning it's negative. To name these compounds, they generally have two endings. They're going to have an 8, AT ending, or an IT, IT ending. Very simple to tell which one's which. So if you look at these two examples, nitrate NO3, nitrite NO2, or sulfate SO4, sulfite SO3, what you see is anytime there's an ATE ending, that is one of the two polyatomics with the more oxygens. Not necessarily the same number of oxygens, just the more out of the pair. And then the ITE endings is the one with the fewer. Notice as well as we look at these examples of polyatomic ions, this is the charge here. So the polyatomic ion itself is NO3. This entire thing constitutes a nitrate, and this entire thing is a charge of negative 1. Over here, SO4 is sulfate, and the entire thing is a charge of negative 2. One difference is the chlorine um, halogens form actually four oxyanions, and since there's four of them, you can't just use the 8 and the I endings because that's not going to differentiate them enough. So what you actually do with the 4 is the highest two oxygen totals end in 8, and the lowest two oxygen totals end in I. Then to tell the difference between those two, between the two 8s, you're going to add the prefix per, P-E-R, to the polyatomic with the most oxygens, and the prefix hypo to the polyatomic with the least. So if you look at it, you can think of it in two different categories. The top two number of oxygens end in 8, 
the bottom two number of oxygens end in it. The most starts with per and the least starts with hypo. Again, you do not have to memorize these names, but it's important that you understand where they come from. So for the rules for naming ionic compounds, you will never have to write these rules for me. It will only be that you have to physically write and name the, the ionic compounds. I give you the list of rules so that you have a reference point to go back and look at. So the rules for naming ionic compounds are first to name the cation and then name the anion. When you see a formula, this is how it's going to be written for the most part. You're always going to have um, the cation written first. If you have a monoatomic cation, you simply say the name of the entire element. You just find it on the periodic table, say the name. For a monoatomic anion, you take the root of the name and add the, the suffix IDE. So for example, chlorine becomes chloride, fluorine becomes fluoride, oxygen becomes oxide, etc. and so forth. If you have a polyatomic ion, you first have to figure out which elements make up the polyatomic. And there is only one positive, meaning the first two letters, polyatomic, which is ammonium. Everything else, the polyatomic, is going to be the last two letters. And all you do is you find the formula on your chart of those last two letters, and you write the entire name of the polyatomic. You do not change that ending to IDE. So in general, the second um, part of your ionic compound name should be three things. It should either end in IDE, ATE, or ITE. So it should be ID, eight, or ite. Those should be your three different endings. Then remember, if an element falls in the dungeon, sometimes it can have more than one chart. So what you're going to have to do is look at your chart again. If on the chart there are two different charges, for example, copper, copper can have two different kinds of charges, you have to uh, let the reader know which copper you have. And the way you do that is you put the charge of copper in parentheses as Roman numerals. So if we practice here, first of all, this is ionic because it's going to have opposite sides of the periodic table. It's binary because it has only two capital letters, and it being binary means it does not have a polyatomic ion. So this is just named like normal. So the Na part, I just say the entire name, which is sodium, and the Br part, bromine, becomes bromide. So the name is simply sodium bromide. For the next one, even though I have a 2 here, it is still just a binary compound. There are only two capital letters, so I name it like normal. The Ca is calcium, the Cl is chlorine, which becomes chloride, so the name is just calcium chloride. For the next one, I actually have three capital letters, so right away I know I have a polyatomic in there. Unless it's NH, um, NH4, I know that the last two letters are going to make up the polyatomic, so I use my chart, I find OH and see that that name is hydroxide. The first part is just named like normal, which is potassium. So the name of this, element, uh, this compound is potassium hydroxide. The next one, again, I have one, two, three capital letters. It has a polyatomic. I look at the last two capital letters, and I find that NO3 is nitrate. Now, if you notice, there's parentheses around this nitrate with a two on the outside. That means there are two of the entire nitrates. Now, the first part is copper. And when I look on my list, I see that copper can have one or two charges. It can be copper 1 or copper 2. And what I have to do is see that nitrate, one nitrate, has a charge of negative 1. Since there are two of them, the entire charge of nitrate is negative 2. So in order for the ionic compound to have a total charge of 0, copper must be the copper plus 2. So the way this is named is copper, 2 in parentheses, nitrate. And then the last one here, again, one, two, three capital letters. The last two make up the uh, polyatomic. And you look on your chart, and that's going to be named chromate. Silver is in the dungeon. Silver is in the D block. But when you check your chart, silver does not have more than one charge, so you do not need the Roman numerals. So the way you name this is silver chromate. For binary molecular compounds, first remember that the word molecular is another name for covalent. So when it says binary molecular, it means basically covalent compounds. The root of the naming is very much the same for ionic and covalent. So for the first element in a covalent compound, you just say the entire name. For the second element, you take the root and add IDE. 
for covalent compounds, you will not have an ATE, an H, or an ITE, an I ending ever. It's always either going to have an IDE ending. So the difference with covalent is those subscripts are very important in covalent because you're going to use prefixes to indicate the subscripts. The only difference is if the first element in the formula is a 1, you never start the name with mono. You just eliminate the prefix. So here are the pro pro uh, covalent prefixes. You do not have to memorize these. You will be given. But they are mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nana, deca. To write the formulas from the names, you simply write the element symbols and you use the prefixes to figure out the subscripts. The naming system that we just looked at um, has come about very recently. So before this formal naming system, um, most of these compounds existed. So some of these binary molecular compounds actually had names before we actually formally named them. These are called common names. And for the most part, we use those even more often than the actual names. Best example you can see in this chart is water. The actual name of water should be dihydrogen monoxide, but we don't use that. We just say water. Another example would be ammonia, um, nitrous oxide or laughing gas that you get at the dentist, uh, et cetera, and so forth. The last type of compound we're going to learn how to name is an acid. An acid is a compound in which when it's put in solution, it releases H plus ions. That's what gives something its acidity. There are two types, binary acids. Remember, bi means two, and that's what we're used to. Those are just acids with two elements. And an oxy acid. An oxy acid is going to be the name for something that has a polyatomic ion in it. To name binary acids, meaning it's not going to have an oxygen. That's going to be key here. Um, it's basically just going to be hydrogen and one other element. You're going to use the prefix hydro. You're going to take the root of the second element and add an ick, I-C ending. Acids should always have an ick ending. Um, some non-binary acids are named using the same rules. If there's no oxygen present, this is what you're going to use. The, the little song you can sing to yourself is no O hydro. If it does not have an oxygen in the formula, then you're going to start the acid name with hydro. If it does have an oxy acid, if it does have an oxygen in the formula, it does not start with hydro. You simply take the root of the word and you're going to add a suffix. If the anion is an eight, like sulfate, you replace it with an ick ending. Remember, you don't use the hydro, so it would be sulfuric acid. The sulfite ending, for example, would have an OUS ending, so that would be sulfurous acid. Hydrogen-containing compounds are named as acids only when they are in water solution. And that wraps it up for our Chapter 7 PowerPoint.